Hello, everyone. Hello there. The connection is good. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much for joining us today for the webinar, Distributed Ledger Technologies uh, as a Basis for CSP's Ecosystem Future. And my name is Yulia Poslavskaya. I am the Chief Marketing Officer here at Nexign. And let me tell you a few words about the company. Since you are here, obviously you know us, but just to remind you, we're a business support systems and Internet of, of, of Things solutions provider headquartered in St. Petersburg, Russia, and we're delivering projects in over than 16 countries across the globe, mostly in the Middle East, Africa, and Russia and CS. So I will be the moderator of today's webinar and um, just a few housekeeping question points. We've got a specifically uh, created the Q&A part in our Zoom webinar. So whenever you have a question during the webinar, don't hesitate, don't wait until the end of the session. Type your question in there and we'll make sure that we address all the questions during the webinar, uh, sorry, at the end of the part of the webinar from that list. So don't wait, type your questions in and we'll make sure that we have them answered. We have a specific, specified time dedicated to that at the end of the webinar. I also got a gift for you and uh, I love gifts. So hopefully you do love them as I do. Uh, we've got a white paper with a profound analysis and practical tips for adopting the distributed ledger technology within CSP's environment. And we'll talk about that white paper at the end of the webinar. And I'm also gonna tell you how you can get it at the end of the session as well. So, so stay tuned for that. And uh, now let me briefly introduce our speakers. And um, with us, we have John Abraham, Principal Analyst at Analysis Mason. John, thank you very much for joining us. Hi, Yulia. Hello, can hear you very well. Thanks, thank you for very much for coming. Uh, we also have two Alexis here. Alexei Chernitsov, Mobile Virtual Network Operators Director from Ross Telecom. Hello, Alexei. Hello, Julia. Thank you for inviting. You're welcome. And Alexei Vedin, Network Monetization Products Director here at Nexign. Hi, Alexei. Hi, Julia. Hi, all. Great. So actually, I see that we have plenty of people joining us for today and it, numbers are keep keeping rising. So really excited to see all of you here today. And I'm very curious to know where all you guys are from. So I'm going to ask you a question. You're going to uh, get a question popping up right on your screen. So don't hesitate and let me know where you guys are from. And I'm here in St. Petersburg in Russia, by the way, these days. I'm enjoying the lovely sunny weather, surprisingly, here in spring. And uh, we've got our speakers from Moscow, Alexei uh, and Alexei are in Moscow these days, and John is from London. So I guess everyone is working remotely these days, as, as well as I do. I kind of getting used to it. So hopefully it will not be too tough to come back to the normal life. And uh, wow, the numbers are pretty exciting. So give you just a few seconds to, to respond. And uh, okay, cool. So we actually get a lot of uh, people coming from Europe, Africa and Asia, the majority and Middle East as well. Uh, the majority comes from Russia and CIS, but uh, the numbers are pretty much equally split uh, with the Russia and CIS in, in other markets uh, as well. Very much exciting. Okay, so uh, I think this is time for us to move further. And I'm passing the word um, to John Abraham. But prior to that, I want to emphasize that, um, as you all know, we live in a challenging times, right? And uh, the world is changing rapidly. All of us notice that, and we need to catch up with this. And today, we would like to discuss with you the ecosystems and the digital marketplaces that expected to play a very important role in the evolution of CSP's business and operating models in the nearest future. And today, we're going to talk about, as announcing the topic of the webinar, about the distributed ledger technologies, DLTs, or so-called blockchain. And nowadays, as you know, this gaining a lot of traction within CSP's environment. So 
I'm turning over to you, John, and you're for our first expert. The stage is yours. Great, thank you. Thank you, Yulia. Hope all of you can hear me fine. Uh, once again, welcome, a uh, warm welcome to the webinar and wherever you are dialing in from today, hope all of you are keeping well and staying safe in these, uh, what do we say, rather unprecedented times. All right, uh, now to get this uh, webinar started, uh, I, I'm aware that many of you may be uh, quite aware of what blockchain and what DLT is, but I just wanna take one slide introducing it just to make sure that we are all on the same page in, in understanding the relevance of this particular technology. So distributed ledger technologies, which I will refer to as DLT in this session, uh, which is also called more popularly as blockchain, uh, is actually a digital database that keeps track of all transactions, all assets and all dependencies in the network. Uh, and it is actually stored in a distributed architecture framework, which means it is not stored at just one location, the data is distributed across multiple locations. Now, traditionally, before the time of blockchain, when two or more parties engaged in any transaction, uh, there was a digital or any sort of a ledger, uh, not necessarily a digital one, but some ledger that was usually used to keep track of all transactions. So this was to ensure that uh, at the end of it all, or at the end of a particular period of time, the settlements and the payments would be accurate and it would be based off, the, off that ledger. The problem began as more participants entered into that particular network of relationship. Uh, so as the, uh, with every new participant, the complexity goes up one notch and eventually uh, it becomes uh, the responsibility of a trusted third party to ensure that all transactions are tracked and managed so that you know, there, is, um, uh, there is proper uh, settlements across the network. So this is actually what uh, the left, figure on the left uh, of your screen represents, um, which is the centralized approach to managing uh, a, a network. Now, DLT uh, actually takes on a radically different approach, uh, which seeks to avoid having this trusted intermediary, but at the same time, uh, making sure that uh, the uh, operating environment is trustworthy and reliable. So how, how do they do that? So essentially, um, uh, the approach here is, again, as the name suggests, the ledger, the digital ledger in this case, is distributed across all participants of the network. Right, and every participant, what that means is has real-time access to all the information on, on all of the transaction that is happening in the network, which obviously increases uh, security and also uh, confidence and trust in, in engaging with any commercial activities on that network. Um, so every time a new transaction is initiated, uh, there is a governing set of principles or protocols, how will you call it, uh, that is predefined for this particular group of participants. Um, and those set of principles are applied and based on that, uh, a, a transaction is either validated or rejected. Um, and then, you know, every accepted transaction is then recorded onto the ledger and that is shared with every participant in the network who consequently update their own ledgers. So that is a very quick overview of how um, the process flows within a, a DLT network. Now, I, I must just point out that what I just described here is how DLT functions within a private network. Uh, uh, because this is how most operators are likely to deploy their DLT solutions. There are also public networks uh, you know for DLT uh, but they rely on completely different mechanisms for validating each transaction so it may not have the same set of rules as I just described and I do I, I just want to call attention to that all right moving on to the next slide um, so why is DLT important for operators the first is quite obvious, right? It helps create a trustworthy uh, operating environment. And that too, based on established technology that has been used in many mission-critical applications uh, in other verticals. 
And this is very crucial as for operators, there are several new and unverified partners, uh, you know, in, in any kind of a new engagement. Uh, and DLT can be quite an effective tool for tracking all types of uh, transactions and activities across the network which by the way does also helps with uh, regulatory compliance requirements uh, especially ones that uh, are necessary for commercial engagements the second uh, is that um, again as i described earlier transactions in this network does not require a middleman uh, obviously there is cost saved through that but also it improves the time to market uh, because you are not reliant on a central agency it improves the resiliency of the overall network uh, and it also uh, provides a lot of opportunity for automating this entire process we all know how big uh, automation is today you know in terms of ad adopting automated practices best practices across um, uh, telecom operations so this helps with that um, Higher CX is another important factor, um, and uh, you know DLT allows for the faster launch of cross-bundled offerings, uh, and it also supports the automated use of analytics, which can help better connect with the customers. You know because there is a lot of contextual information available, and that allows the operator to provide a much more personalized service. And finally, uh, DLT can be an effective tool for cutting down on fraud and revenue leakages uh, in a much more time and cost effective manner. Uh, in the traditional model, there were a lot of uh, manual uh, time intensive process involved, like this dispute resolution and so on, which, uh, which although effective, could take a reasonable amount of time and DLT to a large extent helps cut down on all of that. All right, moving on to the next slide. Um, so I, I wanna tackle one important issue that I've come across several times, uh, you know, as I researched this topic and I spoke to many participants, which is there are many misconceptions about what DLT is. Uh, and I think to some extent it is a factor in the slow adoption of this technology. Um, and I wanna address the four most common ones here. The first is that, um, you know, DLT, uh, or blockchain, as I said, is considered to be too closely tied in with the Bitcoin. And that is not true. Bitcoin essentially is a cryptocurrency that is based on DLT. So it is just one of the many applications that is powered by DLT and it has no impact on the underlying technology itself. In fact, if anything, I think Bitcoin exemplifies how robust and secure DLT is, you know, which should give us a lot more confidence in actually using it for, uh, for uh, mission critical uh, applications. The second is the lack of, uh, or regarding the lack of confidentiality. Um, many operators are concerned that the open nature of DLT will force them to make confidential agreements that they have with their partners uh, public. Uh, and obviously no one wants that. And, and the good news is that that is also not true. Uh, in fact, DLT uh, enables um, a lot of control um, uh, on who actually has access to confidential information, and there are options to make uh, some of the uh, some of that information, um, uh, you know, uh, less visible uh, to the to the public or even participants of a network. The third is often, you know, what is the impact of uh, on existing agreements? Here again, uh, I'm happy to say that you know DLT in most cases is flexible enough to comply with. Uh, existing agreements operators might have with their partners and it will not require operators to change their contracts in any way. And finally, uh, you know, uh, concerns around how expensive it is, how complex can the deployment may be, and you know, what kind of resourcing is available, uh, is the right set of expertise available. And all of that, uh, what I've seen is, is not as big an issue as it made out to be. You know, cost and complexity is, is, much, uh, is quite on the lower side. And, and from a resourcing perspective, it, it's, it's, there is a lot of, um, a lot of expertise available and a lot of um, partners who are available to help operators guide them through this uh, transformation. All right, um, I'll go on to the next slide where I just wanna spend uh, some time talking through, uh, you know, some of the applications for DLT within telcos today. So I, I just wanna point out that the adoption of DLT is quite widespread within telecom op op operators, you know, much, higher than 
the, most people think it is. Um, there is a perception, by the way, that uh, adoption among telcos has not been that high. That is not true. There is a lot of experimentation going on, a lot of uh, trials underway even as we speak. And I've just listed here five of the most common applications. The first one is asset tracking. It's a logistics related use case. Um, and an example is AT&T who uses DLT to track handsets that are returned or upgraded, which ensures traceability of each handset uh, and cuts down on revenue leakages. Uh, a second common um, use case is identity management. Um, and a relevant telco example is Orange, who launched Safe Press, which is claimed to be the first digital trust label for online news. Uh, Orange actually uses DLT to authenticate and verify online news providers and ensure that the content is traceable. A third and probably the most common is roaming settlements. Um, and uh, again, an example here is Vodafone, who actually is working with a couple of other tier one operators in Europe um, for uh, uh, you know, the exchange and reconciliation of data records based on DLT. Um, <clears throat> A fourth is DRM or digital rights management. Um, and um, a good example here is Telefonica, who's actually testing a DLT based platform on which users can manage and probably even sell their personal information. Um, and trials are underway as we speak. Um, and Telefonica is actually partnering with a third party platform provider for this purpose. Uh, but the underlying technology is DLT based. Um, and probably the most obvious one, uh, the fifth one is uh, digital payments. Um, uh, here are uh, uh, several examples in this one. Uh, um, one good one is SoftBank, who has developed a debit card featuring inbuilt uh, blockchain wallet. Um, SoftBank is also working to develop cross-carrier blockchain solutions that will allow smartphone users to make local payments when they are traveling overseas and roaming. So as you can see, a lot going on already uh, with many operators jumping in at different stages with different types of applications. Uh, and I just want to point this out to just uh, set the stage that there is a lot of momentum towards the adoption of uh, DLT today. All right, with that, I will hand it over to Yulia. Thank you very much, John. That has been very insightful observation. So thank you very much again for that. And I'm actually very curious to know the point of view of the telecom operator side. And with that, I am gonna pass over the world to the world and the world as well to Alexei Chernetsov from Rust Telecom. Alexei? Um, thank you, Julia. Um, well. Um, traditional mobile operator offices seemed like an outdated model since the very start. They might work well as retail locations, but uh, this wasn't aligned with our strategy. So we were looking at distribution channels similar to those used by digital banks as uh, opposite to brick and mortar offices. SIM card delivery and omnichannel customer service work great and uh, as soon as the uh, embedded SIM technology started to take shape, we began experimenting with it. Um, Ross Telecom group of companies was among the first in Russia to set up a distribution process fully completed to Russian regulations, which is still a challenge to larger traditional players. Embedded SIM lowers the barriers for customers to try us out, uh, and many of them end up using Ross Telecom as their primary operator. Distribution channels like delivery and uh, embedded SIM also work great with our bundled offers. When broadband clients want to try out our mobile service, they expect to process to be absolutely frictionless. Going somewhere and waiting in the line uh, usually isn't worth the trouble. Offering a bundle of fixed internet, IPTV, and mobile service is not new um, to our market. But uh, the differentiation is uh, convergence and integration between all the services. An example is our Wink Online Cinema, which is uh, built uh, via customer's main account. And uh, we do not charge for traffic in case of mobile connections. All these little things build customers' loyalty and uh, prevent them from leaving our ecosystem. Um, however, our next challenge is to take the ecosystem game to the global level. 
as an you know we are quite limited when it comes to traditional roaming uh, there is no way in about roamers uh, would use uh, our service as uh, they default to the host network operator and it, it's uh, direct competitors uh, symmetrically there is little leverage for negotiation with global roaming partners so that they could offer something tempting to our subscribers our roaming offers are not uh, are not worse than those of larger operators but not uh, very different when tourism game gains momentum again uh, embedded sim can be a game changer now people outside europe are disappointed by roaming surcharges but it takes too much trouble to obtain a local sim card and uh, switch to it uh, so they just uh, stick to wi-fi and avoid any mobile service getting any sim upon arrival or while preparing for trip can be a new habit for travelers and we don't want to be left behind this trend it opens up new opportunities for us to surf inbound roamers as well as uh, to source best outbound offers for our subscribers uh, so they don't need to shop around there is going to be one of the uh, first use case for the project uh, that we're working on with McSign team. And uh, Alexei Vedin will hopefully share more technical details for you. Okay, thank you very much, Alexei. And I do hope that very, very soon we will be back to our traveling routine and we'll be able to experience all the benefits of these technologies for business and pleasure. And uh, Alexei, what is the next science uh, take on this? How next science has contributed to this? Just to be a little bit different from first Alexei, <laughs> I use this thing to be... I love the head, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So next science is not new to the blockchain world. We started a couple of years ago with Telechain Broker. It is a distributed marketplace for CSPs with direct interfaces to their business support systems. It's suitable for selling and buying digital assets like roaming traffic packages, content, and of course, in medicine. Many people historically associate blockchain with cryptocurrency, but we don't use it this way. All financial transactions happen with normal instruments and agreements and blockchain creates a trustworthy environment to ensure asset exchange happens in a transparent and predictable way. We gained some initial traction from operators and used their feedback for further development of our ecosystem vision. First, distributed ledger is a great technology for such kind of solutions. But it is mature, so it makes more sense to standardize blockchain as a service rather than developing a custom blockchain. Separating business logic and implementing a separate layer leads DLT to the role of data storage and communication mechanism, leading to more robust and future proof solution. So we have a question for audience. Uh, what do you think? What is the most inspiring reason to adopt DLT in the CSP's process? First one, increased security. The second is new revenue channel. The third is monopoly risk mitigation. Another one, interesting technical challenge to face with. Hype, we just want to show some activities. And what does it mean, DLT? <laughs> so please uh, choose one item. It will be very interesting. It's actually interesting to see how the numbers are playing. So actually fantastic results, guys. Thank you very much for uh, giving another maybe 10, 15 seconds because the numbers are playing. It's like, you know, these are the currencies on the financial markets, yeah. financial yeah. markets jumping up and down. Very curious. Uh, we also realized there is a demand for standardization of telecom marketplace. In decentralized technology world, a situation when single platform dominates the market is associated with too many risks. There is no way developers can fully protect it from possible performance bottlenecks, or in many cases sticking uh, to just one platform is not financially viable for CSP. 
in case of such difficulties, migration to another marketplace can take month in a non-standardized world and seconds in a standardized one. So we are now developing the multi-chain exchange project, which will bridge the system CSP used these days with a multitude of digital assets exchange platforms. We see these platforms as working simultaneously, sometimes competing, sometimes covering different market segments. At the same time, operators will have access to all platforms with a way to seamlessly switch between them to ensure business continuity. Let me explain this point with a simple example. Uh, once when you need a piece of bread, uh, you go out and see your favorite store is closed this time. What are you doing usually? Yes, we cross the road and go to the next store. So really the same thing we offer our customers. Any available goods in the same currency through several channels. Talking about use cases, embedded SIM is probably the flagship one for us. Alexei mentioned how building global embedded SIM distribution channels can transform what we now call roaming. Let me go into more details on how we see it work. Ross Telecom at this moment generates a number of embedded SIM instances and publishes them on the marketplace. It's not just a description of the offer. Each asset contains a reference to an actual eSIM profile. If foreign operators buy them by the bulk price, add them to its own product catalog and offer them to end customers at local price in a local currency. A customer installs this embedded SIM and can use Ross Telecom services while in Russia. So what it gives us? Ross Telecom gets a previously unreachable revenue stream the foreign operator is not excluded from the value chain and gets fair revenue share. The tourist can use local data rates without playing around with plastic SIM cards or installing suspicious third-party applications. So the embedded SIM applications are not limited to travel cases. We see a lot of potential in machine-to-machine -machine scenarios and business usage when a corporate service offer can be rolled out in no time. The other kinds of digital assets Multi-chain exchanges can handle our content, non-telco digital products like insurance or car rental services, and virtually anything CSPs might be interesting to offer to the end users. So we have a clear view how the, we can use DOT as infrastructure, as a foundation in our projects, but that we understand most interesting business cases and see huge demand from global players. That's why this B2B2X marketplace architecture is a future proof, and uh, this is the real, the real future for telco ecosystems as we see. Thanks, Alexei, and uh, thanks for sharing. And it's always great to see the vendor's uh, point of view on uh, this important matter. And I'm actually very curious to see, based on what you just uh, guys shared, and we'll talk more in depth uh, on this just in a second, if actually our webinar participants are considering joining uh, the DLT based a marketplace, right? And uh, seen here, I'm going to ask you a question. I do love questions so you can understand. So the question is, would you like to consider a DLT-based marketplace for communication service providers? And the answers are yes, for sure, more likely, less likely, not really. I do not represent an CSP as an option here. So um, again, very interesting stats coming up here. Appreciate you guys pressing the button and just giving that this for another maybe 10 seconds. We're definitely going to share some of the observations out of these numbers in a later stage. So far, so far, actually, I'm very curious to see that more than half of the representatives of the webinar are considering with a very high probability to use the DOT based marketplace. Okay, great results. So, with that, I'm going to probably give another two seconds and uh, we're gonna move on ending the poll. Yep. Okay, so um, I got, by the way, I encourage all of you who are uh, on the webinar just to, if you have any questions, you can uh, remind you, we can put them on the Q&A part and we'll come to those questions just right at the, um, at the end of the webinar today. So uh, for the time being, 
I'm passing the floor to Alexei Chernitsov from Rust Telecom. Alexei. Thank you, Julia. Uh, coming back to our topic, we are going to see many changes in telecom, uh, even before 5G is fully available. Embedded SIM is gaining momentum in consumer equipment right now. Um, the latest premium handset uh, supported right now, and we expect more budget-friendly uh, options to replace current dial SIM phones uh, next year. We will develop in this direction too, uh, finding secure and government process complete and way of fully remote SIM provisioning, which is not uh, possible at the moment. The important role of uh, CSP is that they have a very uh, special relationship with subscribers and uh, handle identity management when selling international embedded SIMs in a trusted environment. The next big market opportunity for us is uh, Internet of Things. Uh, with physical SIM cards, it was a quiet uh, process to prepare and connect a smart device. The new processes we are implementing will uh, change uh, the lead time per device to seconds and uh, will significantly increase their manageability. And many IoT devices, vehicles are the biggest example, are not static and should guarantee persistent uh, service while abroad. So there is a room for marketplace solutions in uh, the Internet of Things world too. Um, so, we have a uh, next question, question number four. Um, have you ever tried eSIM on your device? Um, A, yes, B, not, but would be interesting to try, and uh, C, no. Please uh, answer the question and choose one option, A, B, or C. Can I vote as well? <laughs> I would be really interested to try. So hopefully my vote can be considered as well. But I see uh, the numbers coming in and the majority, thank you very much, comes actually, we are very much in synergy with this response. Uh, I either tried, there are lucky those who tried or would be interesting to try. It's an interesting question, uh, of course, because yeah. it's about new market, new fonts, new technology. Exactly, and how you can use it so simply in your business or leisure yeah. time, so that's yeah. great. It's more simple than plastic. Right. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, great. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, so, we also have plans to challenge uh, the status quo in the corporate segment. Right now, uh, companies are stuck with the incumbent network, networks or in some rare cases, create their own MVNO. Moving thousands of corporate subscribers to a network offering a better deal is really a justified effort. The SIM era will remove uh, most of the friction here too. Uh, when the market is ready, we can come up with the uh, tailored offers and uh, that will save companies' budgets without any significant switching times and costs. And uh, I'm sure that the collaboration mechanisms involving the global marketplace are equally applicable to the B2B services. Uh, of course, I think it's an interesting moment for the telecom industry uh, and uh, it's a really valuable experience for us. Um, to use new technical opportunities as soon as they appear and uh, stay agile and adaptive uh, while being the country's largest CSP. Thank you. Thank you, Alexi. Indeed, actually, very exciting times and very uh, great, great potential uh, for the telecom industry today. And I think those who are ready, really ready to embrace these new technologies will be on top of the game. Uh, I believe. Uh, and Alexi, what do you think? Alexi Vedin. Yeah. Uh, looking back, uh, we see that over the past five years, we have seen how digital transformation has had a significant impact on us. Uh, regulatory aspects are approaching realistic conditions. Uh, approaches to business continuity in the era of mobile internet are moving to application-based services. Uh, with guaranteed bandwidth and formally unlimited amounts of traffic. Uh, and the key issue for CSP is maintaining revenue streams. 
replacing basic connectivity and traffic fee with various additional value for customers, as Alexei mentioned. And it means uh, national players need to be global provider for their customers. How can we get this? Obviously, it's possible only through collaboration with global and local service providers. Does anyone want to extra cost in this value chain? Our exclusive relations with service uh, aggregators, clearing houses, globally dominated ITG and a single way to operate. I do believe we have the better path making open and distributed marketplace on DLT with clear and future-proof data model and interfaces, keeping in mind our collaboration with TM Forum for standardization. Besides end-to-end -end cases, for consumers, we see a huge demand from international group of CSP to establish open marketplaces for exchanging network resources. Economics of sharing is not just a nice slogan today. Uh, look at the situation we have in big cities in the last two months. A lot of people are allocated and staying home, sitting down behind their laptops. Is it possible to enhance transmission, adding new energy sources and radio coverage in a few days? Definitely not. There are no marketplaces and even digital trading model when CSP can request and take needed entities instantly. Which way to build such kind of marketplace is most popular today? Of course, uh, this is the DLT-based solutions. Always ready to start operating from the box, from the cloud. Look at the picture uh, on the screen. Uh, we separate typical solution for three layers from top to down. First layer, this is the standard BCS landscape. It contains all applications that CSP usually has. Product publishing and product instantiating are key business flows to integrate BCS with external marketplaces. And no doubt, so every CSP can do it within existing standards. We see data compliance and open APIs. We can use it for multiple purposes, from selling infrastructure as service and energy resources to network channels, radio, and finally embedded SIM and service subscriptions. Second layer consists of marketplace connectivity interface and product instance inventory. It is the main bridge between telecom world and DLT. Product repository in terms of typical blockchain object like assets uh, allow to make your products to be published on marketplace. Product repository contains purchased instances of partners' products before they will be exposed to end customers in BSS layer. And third layer is a DLT infrastructure. It can be implemented in cloud or on a premise solution, but the most important thing here is to keep flexibility and not be locked down on customized infrastructure. And now, if you are trying to avoid of potential risk and commercial conditions, we need to take into account that the second layer needs to support multiple DLT-based marketplaces. We strongly believe this approach will be able to create truly stable and mutually beneficial foundation for sustainable growth. Julia? Yes, thank you very much, Alexi. And uh, as usually, and I do love questions, that's the last one for today. I would like to ask our visitors to let us know, actually, what kind of resources would you like to purchase or to offer on the market, at the marketplace? And um, A, radio network resources, B, eSIM-based subscriptions, C, edge computing, D, non-telco digital services, or E, none of the above. And um, I appreciate you giving us your point of view on that. Interesting results, numbers. Votes, votes continue. Fascinating numbers, by the way. I'm always curious to see how the different audience really cherry picking what is the most suitable for them. That's actually the beauty about the technology that you can always find what can be the most suitable for you here. Okay, I'm giving it another five seconds. Okay, I'm ending the poll. Okay, um, I think it's, uh, it's the right time for us to sum up. What do you think, John? Sure. 
Sure, Yulia. Um, so quite a lot was discussed in the past 30 odd minutes. Uh, and and I, I really hope you found it all useful and relevant. Obviously, there is much more to talk about DLT. It's such a broad topic. And, and we have tried our best to try and summarize the most important bits in the limited time that we have. But before we close, I just want to summarize this session by highlighting what I think are the most important takeaways. The first is that DLT is a strategic long-term initiative. I firmly believe that the best and biggest part of DLT is yet to arrive. And uh, my view is that the earlier operators begin experimenting with this technology, the better they will be positioned to take uh, advantage of it uh, in their uh, you know, operations, especially as digital marketplaces and ecosystem models uh, become more widespread. In fact, in the long term, I also expect DLT to become a competitive advantage for operators in many markets, or at least the ones who have embraced it fully uh, early on. The second uh, is that the adoption of DLT among operators is already underway. This might sound like an obvious statement, but there is a perception that I am aware of that operators are not sufficiently engaged with this technology. Uh, that is not true. Uh, uh, as uh, you know, as I just said, there is much experimentation going on. There is quite a bit of trials going on across a broad set of use cases. Um, and an important factor here that is driving the adoption is uh, both the growing importance of blockchain outside of uh, telco, but also uh, increasing clarity uh, on its benefits and you know, how it can be implemented, and also the rising number of serv um, um, partners and service providers who can actually help operators uh, implement uh, this technology. And finally, um, for operators who are on the fence about DLT, um, I believe it is important that you at least engage and begin experimentation with this technology. Um, I mean, we, we have already talked about how it can become a vital part of uh, ecosystems and marketplaces. Um, and, and for the ones who are beginning, uh, I, I think it is important uh, to note that Private DLT networks are probably the best way to go for the majority of application. And that's, that's probably a good place to begin. That is not to say that uh, there won't be applications that operators use that will use, uh, you know, say public uh, DLT networks uh, as an example. Uh, but the majority of applications and the majority of engagement models, I suspect will be based on private DLT networks. So okay. with that, um, I hand it back to you, Julia. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, John. And uh, that has been more than observant. It's always right, great to see, you know, the all at once summary. I think three points are quite uh, obvious. And I promised a gift. And I do keep my promises. Uh, John, you have recently actually completed... Um, a, a white paper on DLT and quite a practical piece of work, I have to admit. So kudos to that. And would you like us to tell us a few words maybe about the white paper? Sure, sure. Um, so the, the white paper, well, what I've tried to do is uh, to provide a foundational view of what DLT is and why it is becoming more and more important uh, for telcos, uh, especially you know, with the uh, growing awareness of partnerships and ecosystems and digital marketplaces. Uh, so what it does is it looks at where operators are today in terms of their ability to some of, uh, support some of the emerging ecosystems-based use cases. And it also try, ties into why DLT is well positioned to help operators navigate mm -hmm. uh, the emerging challenges and opportunities. Um, I really look forward to having the white paper in, in your hands. Uh, there is much more to talk about. I don't want to take too much time from Q&A. So, uh, so I'll hand it back to you, Yulia. Thank you. Yes, but definitely I'm sure that our listeners will all find this white paper quite accomplished, and especially after today's webinar. And uh, I want to make sure that everybody uh, gets this white paper. So we'll send it over to each of you after today's webinar so you will be able to study it thoroughly and again it's a very practical piece of work so worth really having a look into that okay so i believe not now it's a time for q a and i already noticed that uh, quite a few questions have been coming in so let me see what we've got there 
Okay, just let me have a look. Okay, so um, okay. let probably let's start with this one. How big impact will 5G have on the adoption of DLT? So, guys, who would like to take that one? Okay, uh, I will. I will go with. Uh, I will take that. You John? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it, it is a very important question, uh, and um, I think um, I think it's important to look at it in two ways. The one is that in the regions, especially developed markets where 5G deployments are underway, um, there is a lot of budget, capex investments that is tied to 5G. Uh, which means that uh, 5G will be the primary factor, deciding factor that will drive investments even into blockchain or DLT. Um, uh, and another, another factor is that uh, in all the markets where 5G is underway, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, enabling you know, or better relationships with uh, enterprises uh, through ecosystems and partnerships and so on. So here again, uh, DLT has an advantage uh, for attracting new spend. Uh, so so I, I believe without a doubt 5G is going to be a huge driver for uh, for DLT. But uh, I also want to point out that that does not mean that the other markets where um, uh, uh, where 5G is yet to arrive or won't arrive for the next couple of years won't see adoption. That is not true because uh, across the globe we are seeing greater emphasis on partnerships and ecosystems and marketplaces uh, and all of which is very really well suited for DLT to, uh, you know, uh, take advantage of so I, I, I think irrespective of um, uh, irrespective of 5G or not you know we will see a lot of investments into DLT over the next uh, a year, a few years. Thank you John thank you and actually to continue on this 5G topic I'm probably going to take on the second question um, what type of new pa partnerships is most essential to monetize 5G networks and uh, yep. Um, so, I think I answer to this question. Okay. Um, in case of uh, financial crisis, uh, setup of five G networks is an expensive uh, investment, of course. Um, in, my, in my opinion, um, it can be partnerships like uh, SPV uh, to build and manage networks, uh, so including spectrum sharing and uh, infrastructure. Uh, in terms of services, uh, these uh, partnerships will run by the platform and the uh, uh, carrier network. Uh, for example, many clinics uh, that have uh, the opportunity to provide, uh, for example, an online consultation uh, will be able to additional diagnostic uh, the patients uh, health remotely through many uh, services. Uh, for 5G. And uh, operators uh, will be able uh, full DLT to sell additional resource management, for example, to other operators who in VNO or to competitors, for example. Um, I think uh, it can be a new ecosystem uh, that uh, we will observe in the, the next uh, future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Alexi. Okay, so another one. What redundancy model works best for a digital service marketplace? Um, a single platform with extra robustness or a selection of a standard-based platforms that are easily interchargeable? And uh, that very much looks very much close to what, uh, Alexei, you was talking about, I believe. Yes, uh, let me explain. I think it's not so obvious, but in any case, if we, has, if we have a standard solution, it will be safer for our other players, for our potential partners, especially if you're talking about uh, an open ecosystem. Let's try to imagine a situation when we have a commercial dispute uh, between partners or just a technical issue because of a government decree. In other words, uh, a completely uh, unexpected situ situation. What do we prefer? I believe this is obvious. We must build an equidistant mm -hmm. trading model for this, uh, just to be safe and uh, to have stable uh, foundation and sustainable growth afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, another one, actually, which I always ask myself, so thank you very much for pointing this one uh, into the Q&A. What will be the key difference between DLT and the blockchain? So is it safe to say that blockchain is a type of DLT? Um, well, John here, I think I, 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 will, I will take that question on. Um, so I think it is fair to say that there is a lot of um, misuse of nomenclature here in my perspective. Uh, the, you know, sometimes I, I, I find blockchain and DLT being positioned as completely different things. Uh, sometimes they are positioned as the same things. I think in my view, there is a lot of commonality between DLT and blockchain. Um, this entire technology or the technology behind blockchain actually went mainstream with Bitcoin. So many people closely tied in the entire Bitcoin with blockchain, which is Bitcoin actually relies on a public network uh, where anyone can join. It doesn't require permissions. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, so, so people take it to mean that blockchain for the most part means public networks, while DLT actually means private networks, where you need uh, an invitation or permission to join a particular network. Um, but DLT actually is the foundational technology behind uh, this, this uh, 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 behind you know, Bitcoin and, and even blockchain. In fact, the way the digital ledgers are added is how that name block chain came to be. So in my view, they are one and the same, uh, although, you know, uh, um, perception wise, blockchain is considered to be public, while DLT is considered to be more closely tied with the private networks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that actually makes perfect sense. Thanks for explaining that one, the difference on that one, uh, John. Mm, and, uh, one more question. What do you think the DLT will be in a network function virtualization context and in the spectrum sharing? Uh, can I cover this question? Please. Uh, thank, thanks a lot for interesting question. Uh, Actually, yeah, yeah, I agree that the questions yeah. are very much profound, all of we, them. We have uh, exactly the same project at the moment uh, on Team Forum uh, platform uh, as a potential catalyst project with other participants, and we have exactly the same position spectrum uh, entity as uh, like an uh, one possible asset uh, to publish and uh, to have uh, deals after that and we have uh, a big demand uh, very big interesting uh, collaboration between a group international group of csps and the national regulators so they i mean csps they want to provide some automated interfaces to regulatory um, offices to uh, national regulators just to uh, collect all information about uh, spectrum sharing can you use these uh, frequencies can you use this uh, transmission why is it possible how many transactions you have uh, so it's very interesting model when you operating openly but you can provide uh, some controls and uh, you can be compliant with some regulation, mm -hmm. national or international. So it, it makes sense. It happens right now. We see this uh, process. It's, it's real life. That's good. That's great, actually. Thanks, Alexei. Okay, and actually lots of other questions. It's hard, hard to cherry pick on those, but uh, let me take this one. Uh, do you think adding non-telco digital services like insurance, hotel booking, rent a car, etc., to a CSP product offering on the marketplace would be beneficial for a user experience. And I think this question should look clearly on the CSP side. So maybe Alexei, you would like to take this one. Yes, uh, this is a good question. And uh, I think uh, this is also a good trend for us. Uh, many CSPs are trying to build Gibraltar ecosystem as a part of telco services and no telco services. If uh, CSPs care, uh, care about uh, subscribers, they of course trust CSP. Um, as we know, uh, CSP are, close, are closer to their subscriber than uh, third party services, third party applications. Um, I think uh, DLT um, just let uh, CSP uh, get new offers, uh, new products in, in its ecosystems. 
and uh, subscribers will receive uh, possibly discount or a better price from the base price from the baseline and uh, i think uh, this is common interest among all participants in this chain okay thanks thanks alexi and i think we've got time for one more question just to ensure that we have a good time to answer it so okay and by the way uh, if we don't answer all of the questions so make sure that uh, we will follow up with them with the responses after the webinar so we don't we will not have none of the questions will be unanswered so we'll make sure that we answer all of them okay so let me take this one which telco application will lead the adoption of dot and why who would like to take this one um okay i i, I will take that uh, okay. yeah so um so this is this is an interesting one we we talked about five uh, unique applications that's already uh, being experimented with uh, earlier and i i i think um roaming is most likely to be the leading use case uh, partly because the existing frameworks actually actually uh, allows for a lot of um you know efficiencies to be had by implementing blockchain or dlt uh, you know there is usually a number of relationships uh, with uh, other operators with uh, clearing houses uh, and blockchain is probably well positioned uh, to come and help with some type of those transactions without disrupting any of the other existing operations uh, so it is a it is a great starting point for many operators who want to just try and see to what extent they can leverage this um, I also think one of the other common use cases that I'm seeing a lot is especially for uh, operators with multi-country operations, uh, asset tracking or logistics related um, use cases are becoming increasingly popular, uh, you know, and, and I expect this to multiply many times, you know, as eSIMs become center stage, you know, we have, we will have a number of um, uh, uh, trucks and freight and, uh, you know, crossing domestic and international boundaries and operators will want to have real time tracking of that and also uh, uh, be in a situation to change partners or, you know, apply new policies as may be required remotely. So that is probably uh, uh, an important second use case in my view. Okay, thanks, John. And uh, that's been the last questions for us today. And again, uh, those which we haven't been able to answer uh, online, we will follow up with them offline. Unfortunately, we have run out of time uh, for today's webinar. But anyway, uh, if you still have questions and you haven't had a chance to ask them now to our speakers, please feel free to address them uh, in private. Each of the speakers will be able to continue this meaningful conversation. So John, Alexei, Alexei, and myself, if you're interested to ask anything about next sign. Um, so the contacts are just on the screen. So feel free to write them down. We'll definitely share with you the, the follow-up uh, after the session. Um, thank you very much. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you, John, Alexei. Alexei, it's been a pleasure. And I learned a lot about the DLTs and so-called blockchain today. So thanks to all of you. And definitely there are lots of potential in this um, new embracing technology. So again, thanks everyone for joining. We'll come up definitely with more interesting topics. So stay tuned for more updates and webinars from next time. But for now, thank you very much and take care. Bye. Thank you all. Cheers. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you.